coming off of exhaustion at South by Southwest last week. So I got a little cough, and now I'm trying to get rid of the cough, and I'm like going to cough while I'm up here, but don't worry. It's not COVID. I've been tested. I've been triple vaccinated, but I do need to drink hot water once every like two minutes. So uh, just giving you some warning. Um, oh, I need that. Okay, so hi, I'm Marco. This is me. Um, I run a company called Drop Party. And well, I'm still on the high slide. Um, so basically what we do is um, we create drops at the intersection of fandom and culture. So where there's a large fan base that's really excited about something, and there's a cultural moment that really galvanizes an audience around that, that's where we exist. Um, now I'll go through the whole thing and I'll tell you the whole story, um, but I'll tell you a bit about me just at a high level. I was born in Vancouver, British Columbia. I moved to LA when I was 18. I got married when I was 25. I moved to Austin, Texas to work at Expedia. Went to New York, did a bunch of D to C stuff, and then ended up building Drop Party. I started that two years ago. So um, I have quite a journey and I actually was probably gonna not say as much of it until I started seeing the speakers here today and I think it's important to have a little bit of that personal aspect of what makes you special and relevant to pursue the goals and challenges that you face. And I think without sharing a meaningful amount of my history, um, we'll lack a little bit of the oomph that I think we're all kind of looking for here. This is the intersection of who you are, what you're pursuing, what you're good at, the ikigai idea essentially like I, I want to make sure we get into that so I'll start here by saying I think we all believe experiences matter I shared a little bit of my experience so far I'll continue to share more but we're all here because we want to be in person with each other there's something about the experience of being here because this could have been like a LinkedIn post that Aaron Watson wrote those are nice could have been an exceptional podcast or it can be a conference like this where we're in person or it can be a performance where Kanye West and Kid Cudi are in a box suspended from the ceiling you're going to that event on purpose right you're not going watching the YouTube version of that is not as exciting I mean this picture is not as exciting as being one of those people so we want the experience of it it's the reason why we stand in line for hours and hours and hours in the sun in Orlando to watch a character that we once saw when we were four years old in The Lion King do something in the ride so we can, we're paying, how much How much do you think is to go here? Um, it's like $200 to get in, plus your flight from Pittsburgh to Orlando, plus you're staying in the Disney Resort, right? Okay, and now you're buying a turkey leg that's $18, and you're paying $60 for the Fast Pass, and why are we doing all of this? It's because Experiences matter. They matter to us, they, they define who we are. It's also the reason why we fly to New York and we walk around in the busiest, most COVID-ridden block in the world to have people cough on us so we can experience this beautiful moment which is overstimulating and I just have the time of my life that I'm gonna remember because this experience matters. And I think we all can agree that we like experiences more than we like products, more than we like goods, more than we like actually mostly everything. <laughs> experiences are what we remember, right? Now, we also know that ex life without experiences is bad because we all also remember this. This was April 2020, a month after COVID happened. And what happened in New York right after that? Where did everybody go? Pittsburgh, Austin, Miami, Barcelona, some islands, we all left. We said, yeah, I'm done with New York because the thing that made New York exciting was the experience of being in New York, right? Nobody likes the $3,000 a month, 400 square foot shoebox they live in. That's why nobody's ever there. That's why they're on the streets. So without the experiences of the restaurants and Broadway and Times Square, we don't want to be there anymore. So. I'm going to talk about the experience economy. Now, there's a book called The Experience Economy, and I can't remember the author right now, but it's an amazing book. Uh, and I, I want to kind of dig into what that actually means, because we've heard of, like, the creator economy, right? We've heard of the um, gig economy, right? Uber, DoorDash, 
task rabbit, whatever. We've heard of the sleep economy, Casper. I don't know why that's a thing, but it's a thing. Um, but the experience economy is a thing that matters to us on a personal level. So I'm gonna go into what is the stack of experiences or how do we get to experiences specifically? So we started in, with commodities and like, you know, we were all nomadic people 20,000 years ago and about 15,000 years ago, we decided that we should all settle down and farm and create commodities. So commodities are things that we extract from the natural, natural world, resources, right? So fruit, metals, whatever, right? They're, they're very inexpensive. Like, I'm, I'm gonna use coffee as an analogy as I go through this, just so you can be clear. A coffee bean might cost less than a penny to get that coffee bean, or even a handful of them might be a cent. And then we started to extract those, those, good, those commodities and turn them into something that was a good that people could buy and use almost immediately. So in the example of coffee, you roast the beans and now you got roasted beans, mixed blend from Ethiopia and whatever, right? And then they also, you also, in the goods world, you get nuts and bolts and screws and all the things that people can use. But that created a lot of wealth. And that wealth wanted to not have to go and build their own porch. They wanted somebody to do it for them. So then the service economy existed. And that's people who go and build your house for you or people who drive you around New York in a taxi. This is a service. It's a service to you. I have the money that I've created through manufacturing goods and now services exist. In the coffee example, uh, it's the difference between brewing my own cup of coffee or going to 7-Eleven and pouring it for 50 cents, right? So we've gone from a raw coffee bean to a roasted coffee bean to a poured cup of coffee, and that went from less than a cent to one cent per bean to 50 cents a cup. That's, just so you understand, that's an exponential leap in how much money I'm willing to pay for actually the same core thing. And then we go to the experience economy. So now the experience of coffee, I think we all know a very common one is Starbucks, right? now. An experience is what you're paying for. It does not mean it's necessarily better. We talked about at Disneyland, you're standing in line, is that a better experience than just walking onto the thing? No, it's not. But you like being there with a thousand people who are all wanting to experience this and you all have a shared moment together. That's the experience. Starbucks. I'm gonna describe my experience with Starbucks and I'm sure some of you will remember this if you haven't just gone there this morning. I walk in, I order on my phone, Sometimes before I even get there, I order, I see a cake pop, and I go, that looks good. Yeah, I'll get it, and then I say, okay, I'll have a latte, or I'll have a frappuccino, which is an experience unto itself just with the language around it, right? Like, that's part of the experience of a Starbucks thing. Now, I pay for it, and then they write my name on a cup, and my name is always wrong. I'm Marco, but I've gotten Mitchell, Parker, Arthur, who knows, right? You know, they never hear you, right? And then... By the time you watch them make your coffee and steam the milk and do the whole thing, and then they don't just, you know, bring your coffee to you. They say, Marco! And they put it on a, on a shelf over here, and then you're like, oh, that's me. Or maybe that's Arthur. I don't know. So I go over, and now I got to dig through the four or five cups of coffee to find the one with my misspelled name and make sure I check to see if it's actually my right thing. And that's an experience. It's not a great one. It is an experience, and I'm paying $7.50 for a large iced tea in New York at Starbucks. This is the experience economy. We are paying more and more and more money to have experiences that we remember because those define who we are. They're the things that demarcate our life and the different moments in it. Um, so that's the experience economy. I think you can start to see how most of the things we do are experiences now. DoorDash is now an experience from a, there's the gig economy in DoorDash, but there's the experience of me getting it. I didn't have to leave my couch. I said, I want to watch a movie. I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes browsing movies while the food is getting delivered so that I can watch it with my wife while I'm out. Like, this is all part of my experience that I'm building. So now I'm going to tell you about my experience because I think it's relevant to why I've had some of these, I don't think I'm, uh, the genius that understood it all, but I think how I got there is interesting. Um, so I was born in Vancouver, in British Columbia. Um, I decided I wanted to do music. And I'm an American, American citizen too, so I thought I'm gonna go to LA because that's what ambitious 
young African-American men who want to pursue music do. They go to LA and they produce and they rap and they dance and they do a bunch of things to try and make it in the show business, right? That's, I mean, everybody. I mean, Kanye did it. He went to LA. If you've watched this genius documentary, everybody goes to LA or New York. I went to LA. And my experience there was, um, I'm gonna show this and I don't want to because it's embarrassing. But this is like some of the stuff that I was doing. I was like in a music video and there's this girl, Bella, and I was doing a bunch of stuff. It's, all, it's, it's fun. But I went to LA to pursue music um, and I love music and I love the experience of music. I mean, we all in our teens like put on headphones and turned off the lights and just like listened and cried to like something, right? Or smiled or whatever. It was the, it's, music defined a lot of our experiences. Music is an experience. And I want to create that experience for others as well as have that experience of creating music myself. Um, and I wasn't very good. I'm, I play a bunch of instruments pretty well, enough to compose and produce and whatever, and I can sing a little bit and I can, you know, I can do the thing. Um, but I don't have what it takes to be a prolific musician because being a prolific musician means delivering a song every day from scratch, knowing it's gonna be bad, and letting that go and putting it out in the world and doing it again, and then doing it again, and then doing it again, and then doing it again, until you find your sound. Now, I'm not that kind of person. I'm a product guy. And I didn't know that when I was doing music, but a product person says, I wanna create this song, and I'm going to work on this song until it is perfect. Well, let me tell you, if I show you a song that you don't like, and then I show you the same song again the next day, and the same song again the next day, but don't worry, the kick drum is a little different this time. Or I slow down the tempo, or it changed the melody. You're like, I already didn't like it the first time, Marco. I don't want to hear it again. So I realized this is not for me. Uh, and one of my friends, who is actually now my co-founder, has been writing code since he was 11 years old. And he said, hey, you should try software engineering. And I he said, I'm TAing a course. This is what we're going to use this online thing for the, whole, for the whole semester. And I did it in three days. And I said, oh, I should probably get into this. It seems like this is maybe how my brain works a little more. This iteration, this ability to build product. Um, so that took me to software development. I got my computer science degree. Now, by the way, uh, we talked about experiences not being standardized um, or not being normal. So. Uh, Jason was talking about taking the road less traveled. I, at 18, did not go to school. This is for, to be clear, my mom has a bachelor's degree from Stanford and a master's degree from Oxford. She speaks 10 languages. My dad is an osteopath, a chiropractor, and an acupuncturist, and learned acupuncture from the Chinese when we moved there in 1993 when I was three years old. These are my parents, like the most educated people I know a lot, like, I just said, I don't want to go to school. I'm going to do music. So I went back to school at 21, 22 years old. And I said, I'm not partying. I did that. I'm here to get my degree. So I did my computer science degree in two and a half years. Uh, basically, it's the most intense thing I can imagine. It is 22 units per semester and taking summer and winter courses. I did all that while take, doing an internship just at Boston Scientific. Boston Scientific is a biomedical company. It is very big and successful and extremely boring to work for um, as at an intern, as an internship, but I did that. Um, it was fine. And in the meantime, with my friend who told me to start doing writing some code and learning, we built a couple of products, one called Hover Cars, which was like an extension on your Chrome browser that lets you uh, hover on a link and it would pull up the video and all the comments. You never had to actually click into anything. It would all be there for you. We built a thing called Instant Logo Search. So if you need to find a logo to build your startup landing page, you could find it really easily. And we pulled in all these repositories. And I'm saying a lot of stuff that people probably don't understand, and that's okay. It was a lot of fun, and it didn't make any money. Um, so we was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I actually, then I worked at Capital One. You can see this at the bottom here. Um, Capital One. My now uncle-in-law, I met him through my then girlfriend, and uh, he was like, look, you seem smart. Do you want to come work on my design team? My, we're, we're building a product. We're, we're going to change banking and really sexy credit cards and a bunch of cool stuff. We're going to build a video game to gamify savings and investment. So yeah, I'm down. So I went and did that for a year, and I worked under a product manager. And a product manager is a person who tells you how you're providing value to the customer. What is the experience that they're going to get? And I did not like this person. 
Uh, was, he was fine, but he wasn't very good at his job in my, in my naive and like egotistical opinion at like 25, 24, or whatever. I was like, okay, I know better. Uh, I'm gonna be a product manager. So I went into product management. Now, I know I didn't say this, but I think, I hopefully is, I'm conveying that um, from music all the way to here, and as I continue on, it was about getting closer to actually creating experiences for people, even though I didn't know that. I knew I loved experiences in music. I knew I could build experience in software engineering. Now in product, I get to define the product for a consumer, for somebody who's gonna use this thing every day. And there I, did, I got recruited to a job at Expedia and I moved to Austin and I worked in a product team and I was like the lowest guy, but I knew the CEO, so I got to travel with him and it was a lot of fun, but it was also a lot of bureaucracy and politics and that wasn't fun, so two years later I left that job. And this is when Aaron Watson found me on Twitter. I did a contracting gig with some guy who had a podcast app needed help and that didn't work out because I had a lot of opinions and I just quit, quit a job where I wasn't allowed to have opinions. I was just supposed to do the work. So now I wanna have opinions. He said, I don't like this either. So we stopped working together very quickly. And then I started writing threads on Twitter coming from a music, software engineering and product management background, looking at the direct to consumer world. So Away, Warby Parker, um, Sweet Green, uh, all these brands, these new brands that are emerging. I thought that's great. Everybody knows how to build a brand. But there's like pretty some fundamental things about the internet that like I've learned and I think they should be uh, expressed. So they, though these products can be better. And just writing these Twitter threads built me a little bit of a following. I met Aaron through that. I met a bunch of interesting people and I got a lot of interesting contracts and somehow ended up um, in D2C marketing. <laughs> uh, and I, through this, was consulting. I ended up landing a job at a head, as a head of marketing in an e-commerce platform. That was really exciting. Um, it was really great, but it kind of imploded in its own dramatic startup way, as startups do, founder problems and people having their own issues with control and whatever, and it just fell apart, and that's okay. Um, but after that, I thought, I don't want to be in direct consumer marketing anymore. And I had, through this job, connected with a bunch of celebrities, a lot, lot of like, not celebrities directly, they're talent managers, they're business managers, et cetera. And that led me into celebrity merchandise. So I immediately after that jumped into working with Will Smith's company, and I know hopefully Will Smith is not here in the crowd right now. Um, but I started working with him and his team and doing merchandise for, uh, Bad Boys, um, the Bad Boys for Life movie that came out, the Fresh Prince 30 Year Reunion store, that actually, weirdly enough, sometimes the world just works in these weird, like magical, weird, if you have any faith in anything outside of you, I think you guys have probably experienced this in some little way, and if not, you probably still see the rhyming nature of the universe in some way. This 30 Year Reunion launched on my 30th birthday which means that the first episode of The Fresh Prince launched on the day I was born, and then on my 30th birthday, I got to launch this store and make this merchandise and take these photos and put all, it was a lot of fun, it's really random. Um, also worked with Patrick Mahomes and his team. So Patrick Mahomes' merchandise, he wanted to do something for the, season, for the new season after he just won the Super Bowl, and we did a bunch of stuff. It was great. Um, and I had all these connections, but it was never really about serving their fans, which is kind of the point, right? Like, don't you want to buy products that serve your audience? That's, that's what it was exciting about merchandise for celebrities. Because, and I'm thinking about having to sell stuff through D2C marketing and building the experience and all this stuff. Fan, like celebrities have uh, an audience baked in that loves them, a brand that's baked in that loves them. They have you know, potentially millions of viewers on a weekly basis on TV. So I thought it should be really easy, but we were selling these products and the incentives are weird. So it's not about serving the fans, you all who would buy these products, it's about serving the celebrities and their egos. Now I'm gonna go, a little, give you a little bit of insight into the incentives and why it's, it's weird. Um, Merchandise as a business is generally never going to surpass 5% of the revenue of any given year for any celebrity, any TV show, any movie, unless you're Disney, 
because they're masters of that. But everybody else is very little. So these brands would pay us, these celebrity brands would pay us a bunch of money to design the merchandise, make the store, help them market it. And this would be like maybe a quarter million dollars or more sometimes. And then we'd buy this inventory and we'd be sitting on it, hoping they would promote it. And they'd write one tweet, post it once on their Instagram stories and be like, why didn't it sell anything? Oh my goodness, we just lost $200,000. Ah, let's just write it off as a marketing expense. And that kept happening over and over again. I thought, okay, if you're gonna write off as a marketing expense, we should start with making this a marketing activation and making an experience that people actually re are rewarded, these fans are excited about. The other part of this is that the products that you're giving to these fans are very low quality. They are, uh, the, the whole point is actually to provide fans with a great product, but in the end, the business people are like, well, let's get the cost as low as possible and let's mark it up as much as we can, and that spread is how we're gonna make money. Look, this man just signed a half a billion dollar contract as the highest paid football player in history. And then he signed a hundred million dollar contract with Adidas. Why does this man need to build his own little footlocker online? I don't know why, but I don't know why I'm even running it. And this is kind of getting in my head a little bit of like, the people who you're trying to serve, you could invest into them through products and experiences, yet you're taking away from, you're extracting value from them. Another example of this, was Kanye West, who was one of those earlier slides. At least his performance was. Kanye West, if you guys have been following his music since 2004, like I have been, is colloquially known as the Louis Vuitton Don. This man is selling $90 t-shirts at his concerts that he made for $4.50, and I know that because I've produced some t-shirts like that for at that quality. So he's making an insane margin and he's making seven or eight million dollars in a night from people who are going to the show, but are actually never actually make it into the show because they're outside trying to buy a $90 t-shirt. That doesn't make any sense at all. I don't know, I'm like, it, it frustrates me. So I'm thinking, if the incentives are about extracting value and having these celebrities feel like they have a product that they get to sell and it's about coming to them and giving them money, I thought, why don't we flip this a little bit and make it about serving fans? and thinking about the fan economy and the fan experience here. Um, so just to go on that point of bad quality products, um, this is Travis Scott's merchandise that he put out. Travis Scott is a rapper, a big one. This is the merchandise that he put out uh, with the Fortnite concert he did. Now this is a reflective jacket, okay? This is like this right here, this is supposed to be a reflective 3M jacket that you get to walk around and look cool and it's like camo but reflective. And this is what they, they will mock these things up on Photoshop and then just send them to China and say, hey, we need uh, 1,500 of these. Now these cost hundreds of dollars. I think this one was like $600 for this jacket, $400, something like that. And this is what showed up in the mail. Six months later, that's, a, that's really upsetting for a fan who spent hundreds of dollars there. Anybody like Ariana Grande? This is the merchandise they designed. On the left, you can see this leftmost photo is like, oh, this is what the picture's gonna be. They never sampled it. They never get in person to see if it's good. And then it shows up on a shirt in the mail that looks like she's doing blackface. There's another one here on the right, which basically was supposed to be like a tie-dye kit, which says, these people said, somebody looks like they put a dick stain on her merch and said, there you go, that'll be $100. That's quite upsetting for a fan. Um, one more, this is back to the Travis Scott one. He did the McDonald's drop. He did a partnership with them. Chicken nugget. They said, oh, we're gonna do a chicken nugget pill. It's gonna be so good. This is literally a picture of a chicken nugget. And they mocked up a McDonald's tag on it. They're like, we're gonna sell this. And then six months later, you got one of these like square pillows with a McNugget print on it. That's kind of like, that doesn't, those don't look the same. Yeah, um, okay, so here comes Drop Party. I said I can't do that. I can't do 30 designed products where I know you're only gonna sell out of four of them and the rest of them you're just gonna be holding on to this inventory. Nobody actually wants it and the quality is so bad that, relatively bad to what you're actually promising, they know you're never gonna sell out of it ever and it just sits there in a warehouse. So Drop Party is existing at the intersection of fandom and culture. We do prizes, giveaways, trips, experiences, and these beautiful boxes with premium merchandise in it, party favors, gift cards from 
we try to invest in this fan base as much as we can. And for us, we just want to break even. I don't need to make money here because what we're doing is providing such an amazing experience to fans that it allows brands to come in and work with us. Um, brands who want to be in front of those audiences and they'll pay us to sponsor the giveaways, to sponsor the prizes, to give away some gift cards. So imagine you paid $100 or $150 for a box of amazing product. You, it's for, for the NBA Finals this year. You bought a box and paid $150. We're trying to put $300 worth of value in there for you because I don't need to make the margin. What it would retail at would be insane. I'll give it to you essentially at you just paying for it to get produced. And then we'll make our money as a business by working with partners and sponsors and brands that want us a, want to build a good relationship with those audiences by no, by showing they're investing in them. Um, so the fan experience matters. We've talked about this. This is an example of what we did at our Basel in December. Um, we worked with the NFT project. Crypto's cool, uh, you know, and. Uh, so we, on one of these boxes, we had a hologram box. You could buy, there was this merchandise there that we had rendered in a 3D rotating thing. There's a QR code, and you can scan it, take it to the site, and then you can buy this product and enter into prizes and giveaways. The other thing is that everybody likes winning, right? Now, actually, I think I was just talking to you about this right before. Everything in drop culture is about losing. It's so paradoxical. You go onto the sneakers app and you say, I want to get these sneakers. I love them. 99.9% .9 of people lose immediately. Oh, you just, first of all, you showed up one minute late. Sorry. Uh, I know the drop went live at 10, but now it's 10.01. So sorry, it's over. Or you enter the drop and everybody lost. Um, or, uh, I mean, the other things that are very clear for losing is, actually, let's take an example. If you went, wanted to go to a restaurant that you really love and you went there and it's like steakhouse and you show up and they say, yeah, we're out of steak. Well, you're a steakhouse. No, we're out of steak. You can come back tomorrow. You come back tomorrow. Oh, sorry, we're still out of steak because you were late. That's not a winning experience. We as people like to win. We like to have these things. So we try to overinvest by giving things that people don't even expect. Um, so how we do that is we don't do any lines. We say it's open from this day to this day. And if you are aware of it, you can buy whatever we're selling. And then the only thing we limit is prizes. But we put as many of them as we can trips, backstage passes, uh, PlayStations, I don't know, whatever it is that would be relevant to that audience, we give these prizes out, and all you have to do to enter is to sign up for the drop party. You don't even need to pay. If you pay, you can get way more entries, you can buy these boxes, and we want you to have these great experiences. So no lines, accessible to everyone, like I mentioned. If you want it, you can have it. And high quality. This is actually on the background. This is uh, a very short looping video of what we did with NASA last year when the Mars rover landed. So we worked with NASA and one of their design teams to create premium apparel products that that compete with the likes of Supreme or Kith or Amelion Door or any of this New York Soho fashion house things. We use their same production partners. We use we have our in-house designers and that know that come from a fashion background, fashion materials background, working with merchandise designers to make these products. Um, and then again, at the intersection of fandom and culture, this is where fans are most engaged. This is where they, they're awake. I'm waiting for the World Cup to happen. I'm waiting for the playoffs to happen. I want to be here and I want to buy this. Selling through a celebrity is kind of like cheap, like as, as in like easy, it's like, yeah, sure, but you don't really have to work to earn that customer. And there's nothing there besides like, I'm using my big name to get you to buy a product. What we want you to do is to show up, share, get this thing into the hands of all the fans of this experience as possible. Costco. Now, what I wanted to, when I was talking about these boxes, the big point here is in retail, or fashion, we call things where you don't make money, a loss leader. And at Costco, they call it a hot dog, right? It's the experience that you care about when you go to Costco. How many people have gone to Costco and not had a hot dog? Ever, have you, have you somebody had a hot dog when they went to Costco, right? Yes, there's one person, the two, okay, thank you. Oh, there's the other. Yeah, everybody loves hot dogs. So, but this is the thing, you go to Costco knowing, yeah, I'm going to get a hot dog, but I'm also probably gonna buy a TV because it's half the price of what it usually should be or whatever it is, right? Um, the experience that Costco is aware of is that, the, the experience matters and Costco knows this, so they're creating products that don't make them any money and honestly probably lose them money. 
but they know they're going to make it up somewhere with having the highest net promoter score. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but that's essentially how many people would recommend your product, your brand to somebody else. They have the highest one in history. Not even nobody can compete with it. Probably because of things like the hot dog. Probably things like your $50 membership that you pay. If you don't come to Costco at all or not, not what they deem enough, they just refund it to you. They don't even ask you to say, yeah, sorry, you, you paid $50, but you didn't come, so here's your $50 back. That's an experience thing about them caring about their customers. So um, in our case, brands want to be in front of the audiences that we serve at Drop Party, and they'll pay us to be in front of them. We help them party. We help them really show this experience that's over the top. Um, and really, when we talk about these fan experiences mattering, I, I want to be clear for everybody here who's entering any stage of your career, at your job, whatever it is, the interactions you have with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis in your work, the interactions you have in your own personal life, the interactions you are trying to create with your customers, all of those matter. All of those experiences matter, and they are the sum of those things create how valuable your business, your brand, who, like, how much people want to engage with you, all of that matters. Now, you can't be super on top of every single point there, but think about that when you're trying to pitch something internally. What is the experience that you can create for somebody to make them remember you? When you're, um, I mean, when you're trying to sell a product to a consumer, it's not enough to just run an ad to them. What are you trying to tell them? What's the story? What's the experience? What is their experience with you? What are they going to remember? So that's all, the only challenge I put out here is think about all the touch points you have in your life with each other, with your family, with your friends, with your consumers, with your customers, with your partners, and what is the experience that you present to them? Because all the experiences that you've had have created who you are, and all the experiences you create for others will help create who they are and how they see the world around them. That's it. Thank you. Appreciate it.